we have a great subject this week. Uh, this is something that I don't honestly think many database courses probably touch on this deeply. Uh, being a graduate course, I think this is a, an incredible opportunity for us to take a deep dive into uh, what, in my opinion, and what I think many other people feel, is one of the, the biggest struggles that we have today with uh, any persistent system, uh, and especially with relational databases in general, which is how do we factor time into the equation? And uh, data has become this integral part of our world, and our technology is based around giving us uh, the best access, the best amount, the best quality of data. And if you take time out of the equation, um, we're missing something there, right? So we're going to focus this week on how do we get it back in? How do we put time into our data? So we're going to start with what is temporal data. So um, basically a temporal database is one that includes support uh, for time as a dimension. Now as you'll see in a few moments, there's actually maybe more than one dimension in that which we can look at time and we're going to explore that. Uh, but we're going to focus here on the fact that we need facilities for storing, querying, updating, um, historical and or even future data. So we'll talk about that as well and uh, when that applies. Um, you know, obviously to the database, right, the future hasn't happened yet, so um, the database can't mark things that have happened um, in the future, but you can save uh, information about time periods in the future, um, and we'll, we'll kind of look at that too, and what the, the difference is there. There's a, a subtle yet important difference in, in what I just said. Um, other things, kind of notes here about temporal databases. So uh, once we, we do this in at least um, two dimensions, meaning that we're taking into account what we call valid time um, and also the time things actually happen in the database. So the real time something happens and, and the time um, as it happened in the database, uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Once we get to that point, um, we can never uh, well, we don't want to delete things. Uh, we don't want to be uh, updating things either. We want to be maintaining past information the way that it looked. So you're going to see that we're actually going to kind of have this never update philosophy um, so far as our pure data is concerned. Um, there is kind of one uh, minute caveat there, which I'll get to in the future. But we want to get to a place now where, um, you know, we might move things around and insert new rows, but we're not going to really update existing rows and we're not going to delete rows. Um, that way we retain the information that we had in the past. We have to relate this information to a particular time frame, right? We need uh, some kind of conversation about what are the ways that we can relate our information and categorize it by time. And then how do we do that universally across all of our data in order to make that happen? If we take a step back before I get excited and I want to jump in, but if we take a step back and look at what a database looks like without any of this, um, a conventional database sees uh, basically just the data in its current form, right? So what do I mean by that? Um, you know, imagine that I have an employee record um, and my salary now is, is you know, some number, let's say uh, $10,000, um, and my salary five years ago was, you know, $5,000, right? So if that's the case, right, um, if I have one record in that database and it has a salary field, uh, then it's most likely stored as $10,000. But if you want to know for, you know, some kind of audit or something, what was Brian's salary five years ago or six years ago, um, it's still only going to show the current amount, right? Um, so that is what I would say most likely 90% or better of database tables today currently know, right? They only know this snapshot form of the world, this, this current version. Uh, they don't know much about the previous version. Um, there's a whole lot of other reasons why this would be a good thing. Um, you know, what if you're a retailer and you want to offer like a certain coupon on a product? 
um, but you only want to do it on a single product at any given time. And you know that these coupons, I mean, anyone who, who's used coupons, I hate them, um, <laughs> but a lot of people around me love them. They drive me nuts. Um, is that, you know, there's going to be date requirements on there and there's going to be all kinds of requirements that you can't use them with other products and that kind of thing. So in order for you to kind of come to this conclusion of, you know, can I offer a coupon on this thing and, and have it be the only coupon offered, you have to know not only all the other coupons, but you also have to know uh, what time they exist through, right? Um, when do they start? When do they end? So that you can say, oh, well, well, right now, currently, there's another coupon on this product, but as of next Thursday, there's not. So I can I can create a coupon then for it or something like that. Um, you know, auditing is huge here. Any, any changes you make to a database, any large company usually has some kind of audit procedure where they have to uh, report information back. And what we do nowadays to kind of deal with this is we create history tables, which does uh, in some ways solve some of this problem, uh, but it doesn't solve all of it because we usually create a history table for very specific things like the employee salary. Um, you know, so it might just be for even certain attributes of a, of a relation, um, but oftentimes it is for particular relations. So, uh, for example, your course registration, um, you might register for a course, right? And then you might drop the course, and then you might register again, um, and you might do one through the registrar's office, and you might do one through the web, um, and if we just have that current snapshot, all we know is the last thing, right? Either you registered or you dropped, but we don't know what came before it. And if we have a history table on that, which most schools I'm sure do, uh, then we would know, okay, well, you know, on November 5th, you registered on November 6th, you dropped, and then you re-registered again on November 8th, um, which means you're still, you know, uh, okay to register um, at that point, right? But if you had registered on January, uh, you know, 28th or something, then that might be past when, when the registration period is. So, um, or we might need to know historically, like when, when did you uh, drop and when did you re-add? Um, so auditing is, is absolutely huge. And unless we make special provisions, and that's kind of the key here, um, we can't do it effectively. And for years and years and years, people have been looking at different ways where we could kind of approach this universally. Like, is there any way we can think about a database so that all aspects of temporal concern are taken care of, right? Can we incorporate it into the SQL standard? Can we create some data types that will support it? Um, these were the questions that uh, drove a lot of research, uh, you know, as far back easily as the 80s, maybe even before that, but I've definitely read some papers through the 80s, 90s, uh, all the way up to the current time. And it's a hard problem to, to kind of put it mildly, and we're going to touch on some, some different aspects of it, but it's a very, very hard problem to solve. Uh, so to kind of sum this up, a conventional database, right, it's a snapshot of the enterprise, uh, no information about the past, uh, changes are viewed um, as modifications to the state. So if you change my, my salary, you've, you know, and I don't have that history table, you've lost my old salary. Um, and basically what we're doing here is we're looking at the world through an evolution of transactions from one state to the next. And you can create a history table and try to store that historical piece, um, but it will still only give you the specific things that you engineer that history table for. A temporal database, or at least the concept of a temporal database, is going to maintain that historical information for us, um, hopefully. Right? I mean, we might have to put the pieces in place to make it work, but the idea here is that once we put it in place, it's going to just happen, right? Because we know what procedures to follow, or we know how we built it and encapsulated it in such a way we could force that. I'm going to talk more about that later when uh, we get more into uh, 40F lib and how I think it's a solution in this space. Um, you know, but that's that's basically the idea here is you we have to make the changes. Um, we have to provide a method to do it. Um, we need to do it efficiently. One of the one of the 
concerns in this space is that, you know, especially with really large scale data, is that, you know, if you add a, a time component, depending on how often the data changes, you could take a table that has, you know, a thousand rows and all of a sudden it could have millions of rows, right? Because uh, depending on how often that data changes, that could be a problem, right? And one of the ways that that's usually addressed is that they create the history tables uh, and move them off separately into another table so that you have your snapshot table of current information with less rows separate and that's the one that's accessed the most and uh, will be accessed more quickly and then uh, the information in the historical one that has a lot more content is kind of like an archive and it's only accessed when you need to update the history or review it um, and that's that's one way to approach that now i don't i don't necessarily think for every use case that that's the correct uh, method to approach it and i don't think that it's completely wrong for every use case either so uh, we'll, we'll get more into that later but uh, that's that's another thing to think about as i go through this content here the the first half of of this week's content uh, specific to temporal databases i want to bring up a couple of big references uh, that i'm using here uh, one is called time and relational theory uh, it's actually a book uh, this one here uh, from 2014 um, and this is a, a pretty comprehensive uh, guide to, to temporal databases and, and where status is at with that. Um, another one that, that's been around for a while, in fact, I think um, uh, this author has a newer version of this book, um, but I'm not honestly sure, and this is the one I had from a while back. Um, this one is also available, the second one, as a PDF online from the author, so it's not, you know, a bootleg or anything. Like it's completely legitimate that the author just offers it for free as a as a PDF. So, uh, if you're curious to check that one out, please do. Uh, that's the developing time oriented database applications in SQL. Now, both of these are attacking the problem from a very, very, very database SQL oriented point of view, and. And I don't think that's necessarily a wrong or a bad thing. I, I you know, I think that's probably, uh, if it was possible to do so, the best possible way to solve the problem. Um, but I'm not sure at this point, you know, being that we're like 40 years into to researching this, uh, that there is an effective solution really at this level more so than what we're doing now. Like, you know, the occasional use of history tables and stuff. Um, as an engineer, this bothered me. This problem bothered me, and I wanted a way to kind of more holistically solve the problem, right? And for me, that meant not dealing with the problem at the SQL level and more at the application level. And since that's where we are now with our class, where we're talking more about how our applications connect to the to the databases, um, this is a good time to, to kind of discuss in that contrast. Um, but these are two really good references as, as we go through this. So uh, if you want to look them up, especially the second one there that had the, the PDF, um, you can do that. Uh, there's a few types of things that, uh, concepts I want to go through. I'm just going to to dive right into them here. Uh, the first is uh, temporal data types. So uh, if we're going to save something, in, in SQL, we need a data type in which to, to save it, right? Just like if you're going to have, uh, you know, a var car for text, or you're going to have an int for a number, um, or whatever it is, right? And the same goes for temporal data types. So to figure out what data types would be appropriate for us to use, first we have to break apart what are the types of, of time, right? And the ones it turns out we care about, I'm going to talk about three of them, but you're going to see in a moment these last two are a little bit, uh, a little bit of a gray area here, um, it's at least in the literature, not so much in what they are. Um, but the first idea that we would need data types for is an instant, right? So something that happened in an instant of time uh, at a very specific moment in, in time, uh, like I had the words that came out of my mouth five seconds ago, um, you know, I said X. So that's an instant. And that's um, easily expressed. That's that's not something that we struggle with as far as uh, database types or even uh, higher level uh, application programming types, right? We have things like date and date and timestamp and time, right? Um, 
And those are all part of the SQL standard. They're all implemented widely by the relational database management systems. That's all pretty straightforward. But then we have a couple of other ways to think about time that are not so straightforward. So we have this idea of a period. So a period is a range of time. So I had my, my example earlier with my salary, right? And I think I said five years ago uh, that it changed. So, you know, say the original span of time was from, you know, nine years ago uh, to five years ago. On some specific dates, I had a salary of $5,000, right? And then after that period, um, I had another period where I had a salary of $10,000 from you know, five years ago to the present day. And there has to be a um, discrete start and end to do with this. So you, you can say now is the discrete end, but what you're doing there is you're actually, um, you know, at that point in time, you're considering now as, as that current time, right? So whatever now is now, that's what you're going to plug in uh, that end time. And, you know, if you do the same query 20 minutes later, you're going to have an end time of 20 minutes after, right? Unless that period ended 20 minutes before, in which case you would still query for the same end time, right? But if it's an open-ended end time like it's now, then you can think of it as now is the end time. Um, you're basically taking two instants and you're saying all the time in between uh, is what I care about. And it has direction, right? Unlike an instant, which happens at an instant, at a discrete moment, as best we can, uh, you know, sample that out of the analog world of, of time, um, a period has direction, right? I'm, I'm going forward in time or I'm going back in time, but it's between two points and it has direction. We don't have an effective type to deal with this in SQL, right? So in that, that's still currently really true. We can deal with it... Um, by using two instants and then applying some kind of logic uh, to query between them. But it's not a native type, right? It's not a native data type. The last one here is interval. And so the definition of interval, the, the textbook definition is an amount of time. So a day, a week, a year. So I could say, you know, um, add a week to today and tell me what day it is, right? So an interval is, you know, a set amount of time. It doesn't have any anchor point um, unless I, I give it one by saying I want to know what the instant is that adding a day to now gives me, right? So what I'm resulting in is an anchor point, but the interval itself is not. The interval itself is just a description of time. It's unanchored, um, and we do actually have a data type for this. So we have now interval data types. They came later in the SQL standard, but they are in there. So uh, you can reference day, year, that kind of thing, at least by the SQL standard. Um, I'm not entirely sure how all the relational database management systems have implemented this, although I'm sure they have. Um, in the literature, this is important. In the literature, interval and period, when it comes to temporal databases, are commonly uh, intermixed. You will see them used together all the time. So um, some authors will refer to a period as an interval, and some authors will refer to an interval, um, or you know, vice versa, they'll refer to it as an interval, um, and some will call it a period. Um, I'm not partial to either. I just want to point it out. Um, I don't know how this started. If you want to be strict about it, I think it would be better to call it a period because an interval does um, have another connotation. It has a connotation of an amount of time, but a lot of authors actually use the word interval to also describe a period, right? Um, two discrete anchored time points in, in the time in between, in addition to, you know, also an interval being amount of time. So it's just it's just a little confusion on the wording. Um, I'll try to remember to stick with period, but from here on out, um, I don't really care about interval for it being an amount of time. That is easy. We have a data type for that. We have all kinds of ways to deal with that. Um, that is not actually pertinent to our conversation as uh, here about uh, temporal database. So if you do hear me say interval from now on, what I'm really referring to is the definition of a period here. Um, and that might happen because to be honest, a lot of the authors I've read 
um, consistently refer to as an interval. Um, so it's just kind of natural and it just happens. So from here on out, if I say interval or I say period, what I'm defining there is period. If I ask you on a task like, you know, what is the definition of an interval, like the textbook definition, then what I'm looking for is, is the bottom answer there. Um, and I'll try to keep that straight, at least when I'm asking for the definitions. But for going forward here, when you see me when you hear me say interval or period, I'm really talking about what's defined here as a period. Um, now, in addition to those types, we have kinds of time that we care about. Now, I, I hinted at this a little bit before, but there's two main types that I want to talk about. Um, some some literature defines uh, user-defined time. I don't, I don't really care about that. That's That's not super important to me right now. I'm focusing in on what makes a database temporal and what the differences are in time and dimensions in time. And uh, let's get started by exploring uh, valid. So basically what, what valid um, data is, is we have to represent our belief about information, right? So, you know, I could have the belief that I started work at Maris College on May 9th of, of 2010, right? That could be the statement of belief. Um, because that's what's in my database. If you go to um, you know the the database and you pull up my employee record and you look at the the first day of work or the start date or whatever you want to call it, um, let's say it's in there as five nine twenty ten. But then what if we realize like we pull up a calendar and we realize that's a Sunday, and obviously I didn't work my first day of work on a Sunday. At least I didn't. Right, it wasn't um, a Sunday type employee. Uh, so you know, that must be an error. You know, so maybe somebody typed it in wrong or um, whatever the case, right? Whatever it was, uh, the representation we had, our, our um, belief about this history is in fact flawed. So this happens all the time, right? So somebody makes a change to the database and they determine my actual start date must have been the Monday that followed, so they change it to be May 10th of 2010. Okay, so what we've proven here is just that valid time is our belief about history. It has nothing to do with when the database actually uh, changes the time, or the date in this case, or changes the record in any way. Um, it doesn't know when the original date of 5-9-2010 was even entered. For all I know, this system didn't come online until three years after I was hired, and in 2013 they entered in that wrong date, right? Valid time doesn't know that. Valid time is just our belief about the record, the thing that we care about. Um, it is what it is, and it can be updated, right? So, um, as we just saw, I... I had a time that we thought was invalid, so we updated it and corrected it. We also consider this the first dimension of time. So if you hear a reference to a unitemporal database, uh, what is being discussed is this, a database that deals with um, just valid time. Um, so if we have this one dimension, right, um, you know, think about it, and, and we kind of talked through this, but think about what it means for report writing, right? So if we had changed that date of mine and we corrected it, um, you know, say we corrected it in this case in 2015 uh, to the correct day, uh, and we only have this one dimension, what would a report say if we ran that today? Obviously, it would give me the, the corrected date of, you know, May uh, 10th, I believe it was, 2010, right? But what if we ran that same report, but we cared about the data as it appeared in 2014, right? In 2014, because we said we corrected it in 2015, in 2014, it would have said uh, May 9th. But we don't know that anymore because that information has been lost to us, right? So valid time only tells us part of the story. The rest of the story, to get to the rest of the story, we need a second dimension here. We need what's called transaction time. Transaction time tracks the periods in which those beliefs about the valid times were legitimate. So this is the actual time associated with the change itself. When did the database actually commit that information? Uh, when did that information get recommitted as another value? 
In order to do this, right, this is where you need to absolutely have more than one, um, you don't necessarily need more than one tuple per se, you actually just need more than one place to store that attribute value if it's just an attribute that you care about uh, and link that back somehow. But in the context I'm going to be talking about temporal databases because I want to, I want to approach it as a holistic uh, solution that, that encompasses all the data, then I'm going to treat it as you're going to have multiple rows um, now because you have to, right? You, um, you have to address the fact that, um, you know, at one point I had uh, this date and at another point I had that. And those points aren't really instants, right? They are periods um, or intervals, I like to use both terms. Um, but there's a period of time in which I had May 9th and a period of time in which I had May 10th. And now that I know that information, I can now query on a report based on the date I want to see it by, and I can see that information as it looked at the time that I care about, right? Um, these times we can't change, right? Because it's not like a valid time where we can be like, oops, we got it wrong. No, we can't. Like, it absolutely is. This is just a representation of when the database changes the record. It has nothing to do with the actual time that was changed. Um, in this case, in my example, I'm changing a date that happened, you know, five years in the past from when I'm changing it because I'm changing it in 2015. So the transaction time is going to be whatever date it was in 2015 that I actually commit this change. But the time I'm changing, the valid time, is a date in 2010, which is five years before. That time, like we said before, can be different from the current time, the valid time. But the transaction time must be the current time. And you can't go back and change it later because that defeats the whole purpose. This becomes the way to audit um, and make sure that you have all the information in there uh, that you can, right? So that you can basically replay through time what the data looked like at any given moment. So there is also a place for additional dimensions here. Um, if you look at the literature, there's uh, examples of tri-temporal. Uh, one example of that would be um, a decision time. So in addition to recording the valid time, which is the date that um, you care about, right, which is my start date, and um, the transaction time, which is the date that you actually preserve the thing that you care about. You could also preserve something like the decision time, like the time you made the decision to um, have that transaction to change that valid date. This is, in my opinion, um, you know, sometimes necessary, but for the general purpose uh, piece of this, to get just to our goal of having a database that can replay everything, not entirely necessary. It might be entirely necessary to add another dimension for a particular use case, but it's not necessary to get us to the place we want to be, which is a database that remembers everything through time and can regurgitate to us what everything looked like at any given instance in time. So we don't actually need these uh, additional dimensions. So what we care about is, is primarily in the first two.